study today will be Revelation chapter 1. So if you want to have a bookmark in Revelation chapter 1, that would be a good idea. Elder Randy texted me this morning and he said that he was uh, sad that he couldn't be here. But he also texted me a quote that I want to share with you. Christ Object Lessons, page 116, says this. Christ is represented in the scriptures as a gift, but only to those who give themselves soul, body, and spirit to him without reserve. That is the brunt of revelation, and that is the message throughout all scripture, is fidelity to Christ and to our Heavenly Father. I've asked you this before, and I'm going to ask you again. Were you blessed this week? Amen. If you, cannot, if you look back at the week and you cannot pick a specific blessing, remember this. There is an empty tomb in, in Judea, and our Christ sits at the right hand of God. Amen? I want to say this about Revelation and Daniel. Revelation and Daniel and the other books of prophecy are not something we come to lightly. Amen? These are deep books with deep themes and stark lessons for us today. They are not for times past. They are relevant. Amen? Amen. Why do we study prophecy? Why do we study prophecy? It is not to gain knowledge. It is not to gain an academic, it's not an academic endeavor. It's not to hold some information over our fellow men. Oh, I know this from Revelation, or I know this from Daniel, I know this represents whatever. We come to prophecy to know Jesus. And we come to prophecy because God told us to study it so that we will know what is coming and so we can tell people what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 1 is an introduction to the book of Revelation, but there is a lot packed into Revelation chapter 1. As I started writing this sermon, I found out quickly just how much was in there, and uh, I would cover your prayers to help me get through all of this. Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, page 131. This one struck me as I was going through this study. Those who would accept positions as educators should prize more and more the revealed will of God so plainly and strikingly presented in Daniel and Revelation. Plainly and strikingly revealed. That goes to a, the heart of a deception that revelation cannot be understood. There are two types of prophecy throughout Scripture. How many types? Two, two types. Classical prophecy and apocalyptic prophecy. Classical prophecy deals mostly with those prophecies that are conditional in nature. If you do this, God will do that. If we remain faithful to God, we will remain his people. We see this all throughout the Old Testament in God's dealings with the nation of Israel. One such uh, conditional prophecy is uh, Jonah's prophecy to Nineveh, that Nineveh would be destroyed. But once they repented, the Lord stayed his hand. Apocalyptic prophecies, like the one like the book we will study today, such as Daniel and Revelation, explain when and why events will happen in the future to prepare God's people for it. And there are, we've been through this many times, but it's good to, good to go back over it, there are three distinct ways to decipher prophecy, but only one that I believe works. Those three ways are called futurism, preterism, and historicism. Futurism is how it sounds. It takes the prophecies mainly of Revelation and it throws them all the way out in the, in the far future. And so they, we ignore the rest of Scripture and we say we can't understand these and so we come to these wild interpretations of the symbols in the book. Preterism deals mostly with the book of Daniel and throws all of those prophecies in the distant past. They're already fulfilled. You ain't got to worry about them. And this is just not true. 
If you go to Daniel, especially towards the end of Daniel, you'll find things that haven't come to pass yet. But historicism. Historicism is how the reformers, during the days of Martin Luther, Jerome, and Huss, that is how they came to the study of Revelation. Historicism takes the stream of Bible prophecy and lays it over the stream of human history and it helps to make the interpretations a lot clearer. As Seventh-day Adventists, how do we interpret Bible prophecy? Historicism view. Historicist view. I believe that it makes it far more clearer than it is sometimes thought to be. Revelation has been steered away from because some things are sometimes hard to understand. And I'm not claiming to have all of the answers for you. But as we study through the Word of God, from front to back, we can come to those answers. How many of you have spent time out in the woods hunting for morels? Morel mushrooms are awesome. Some people don't like mushrooms, but those people are a little weird, so... We love morel mushrooms in my family, and I've spent a lot of time in the woods with my dad and my grandfather looking for morel mushrooms. When you go to look in the woods for a morel mushroom, do you step in the woods, look down, and if you don't see one, you go home? No. You search, and you search, and you search. Sometimes you go to a different spot, and you search, and you search. And, some, and a lot of times when you find one, you find many. We saw a picture from one of our friends in the UP this last week where he had found a hillside of morel mushrooms and he took over 50 morel mushrooms home. The Bible says that we should search for truth like morel mushrooms. When you find a morel mushroom, you feel like you found some treasure. Amen? As we search for, part of the fun for searching for morel mushrooms is the, is the search for it. And then, Part of the fun of, search, of finding Bible truth is the search for it. As you go to one place, you might find some other truth that you weren't even expecting. Great Controversy, page 521 and 522 says this. The Bible was designed to guide, to be a guide to all who wish to become acquainted with the will of their maker. God gave the men the sure word of prophecy. Angels and even Christ himself came to make known to Daniel and John the things that must shortly come to pass. Those important matters that concern our salvation were not left involved in mystery. Amen? The word of God is plain to all who study it with a prayerful heart. And no church can advance in holiness unless its members are earnestly seeking for truth as for what? Hid treasure. Hid treasure. Everything in here is a treasure. Amen. Amen? I praise God that he saw fit to put things in a book. Because I can't really remember things very well from off the top of my head. So now I can go, I can say, hey, God, put it in here. It's good to memorize the Bible, by the way. Let us turn to Revelation chapter 1. And we will read Revelation 1, verses 1 and 2. Amen if you're there. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. From the beginning of Revelation, it uses what word? This is a what? Revelation of who? Does anyone know what the Greek word for revelation is? Apocalypsis. For the title of the book, the word is apocalypsis. Do you know what apocalypsis means? The Greek word apocalypsis literally means to lay bare, to make naked, a disclosure of truth or instruction or a manifestation or appearance. So where then did, did, where did, where then did we get this idea that it's a sealed book? 
If the very first line says it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, a revealing, a laying bare of Christ, where did we get this idea that we can't understand it? There are some things that are difficult to understand within this book. And so some scholars, quote unquote scholars, have erroneously deemed this book sealed. There's only one portion of scripture that's ever been sealed. What is it? Daniel, dealing with the 2300-day prophecy. These scholars still use, like to use quotes from Revelation, and they still like to take guesses at what the symbols mean, but they fall short for various reasons. In fact, sorry, they fail at interpreting this book because they fail to realize who it is pointing us to. Who is it pointing us to? Jesus. It's pointing us to Jesus. It's a revelation of Christ. In fact, the whole book of the Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the beginning and the end, the author and finisher of our faith. He is our almighty God and our glorious redeemer. He is the gold thread woven throughout the tapestry of the scriptures. Amen? Amen? Verse 1 states that it is a revelation of Jesus Christ, not of beasts, marks, plagues, or whatever. A revelation of Jesus Christ, and wherever Jesus is, it is safe to go there. Amen? Verse 1 goes on to state that it was given to Christ to show, to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Our God is merciful and loving. He does not want you left in the dark to the future. Amen? He wants you to be brought closer to him. He says, here's the events that are going to happen. As they happen, look and know that I am God. This revelation was given to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he was faithful in bearing this testimony. And you know, I've never really given that verse much thought in verse, that statement in verse 2. He bare record. But I believe that this verse was, this statement was set aside as its own verse for a reason. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I accidentally printed my notes in like a 12 point font, so I'm having. Just squint a little bit. <laughs> I've never really given this statement much thought in verse 2, but I believe God inspired this verse to be set apart as its own statement when the Bible was compiled. God gave John a message to bear, and he was faithful in it. Has God given the Seventh-day Adventist church a message to bear? Yes. Which message? The third angel's message, the three angels' message, and namely the third one. Like the prophets of old, we must remain faithful to our calling and preach the message of warning entrusted to us. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He preached repentance and following the Lord. The end time remnant is called to the same mission. We are the forerunner for the second coming heralding his soon coming, and we are to proclaim his glorious appearing, which is soon. It also says that God was showing John things which must take place way in the future, right? Shortly. It says things that should shortly come to pass. Things were going to start happening shortly after the revelation was given. Circling back to a previous statement that I made, people have deemed this book sealed and unable to be interpreted properly because this book is number what? 66. It's the 66th book of the Bible. How can you interpret or understand the 66th book if you don't have the other 65? Amen? In fact, much of Christendom has thrown out the Old Testament except for their favorite stories 
and intriguing prophecies because they deem it not important. When it is more extensive than the New Testament, the New Testament containing 27 books and the Old Testament containing 39. When Christ walked on his earth and his servants went to work after his ascension, when they referred to scripture, they referred to what? The Old Testament, because that's what they had. The New Testament was still being compiled. So everything in the New Testament has to, be, has to align with the old because that's what they were using. We also cannot understand this work if we throw out the Old Testament record due to the fact that when we do a cross-reference, there are over a thousand allusions or direct quotations in the book of Revelation from the Old Testament. Let's continue on in our study. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is what? The time is near or in the King James Version the time is at hand. What is this verse stating for us? It's almost stating the same thing that the last one did. <clears throat> this is stating that it's not a sealed book. John is writing that the book should be read out loud and that people should hear it and do the things that are written therein. Amen? Amen. Our God just doesn't throw things into Scripture just to fill up the pages. Even if our minds can't understand why something is there in the first place. One more time, this book is not sealed. This book can be understood and our God wants us to know the things that are coming upon us. I don't, have, I don't feel I have to state this in a Seventh-day Adventist church, but I'm going to because someone somewhere might watch the recording or maybe you need to hear this. The Bible tells us to do very specific things in our worship and how we conduct our lives in order to glorify God and he pronounces blessings on those things. This statement, blessed is he that readeth, and so forth, is not just for the book of Revelation. It is for the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. That being said, I believe God inspired this verse to make it very plain to our minds that this book is a blessing when we read, hear, and follow it because it points us to who? To Jesus. Once again, revelation of Jesus Christ. I think that's very plain. Why should we read here and do the things in this prophetic book? It's at the end of the, that verse. It's okay, you can speak up. <laughs> For the time is at hand. Is Christ coming close? Yes, I can emphatically and unapologetically, unapologetically say yes. As I survey the world around us, I am brought back to the statement from Sister White in Maranatha, page 220. The great controversy is nearing its end. Every report of calamity by sea or land is a testimony to the fact that the end of all things is at hand. Wars and rumors of wars declare it. Is there a Christian whose pulse does not beat with quickened action as he anticipates the great events before us? The Lord is coming. We hear the footsteps of an approaching God. I say amen. And even so, come Lord Jesus. The time is near and our God is coming to save us. Revelation 1 verses 4 and 5. Revelation 1, verses 4 and 5. And to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of, king, of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his what? in his own blood in the precious 
untainted blood of Christ, you've been washed. There's a lot to unpack in these two verses. We just don't have the time to hit everything, but I will hit the high points as the Holy Spirit put it in my head. We see John here displaying the love and care of Jesus and greeting the brethren with peace. But he states that the peace we all seek only comes from one place. And he puts the Trinity in there. He says that peace only comes from him, from him which is and which was and which is to come. This is speaking about the Father. It also goes on to say, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. This is placing the Holy Spirit again on equal ground with the Father. Do not get tripped up in that seven spirits thing. Seven denotes completion within the Bible. This is saying that the fullness of the Holy Spirit is before the Lord. Are you with me? He doesn't leave Christ out here. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. Friend, maybe today you are feeling restless. Maybe you are feeling depressed or you don't know where you fit in the grand scheme of things. Look at that statement again in verse 5. Jesus Christ that loved us and washed us in his own blood. Maybe you haven't heard it in some time or maybe you haven't heard it at all. But wayward child of God, he loves you. And he wants to dwell with you and in you. His blood screams from the ground of Calvary that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ is not ashamed to call you brethren. And beloved, now are we the children of God. There is no greater title than that. I can have a high position at work or in the government or even in the church, but it does not mean a thing if my name doesn't say child of God in the books of heaven. I've said it before, he didn't have to go through the cross. I said it in the last message, he didn't have to do it. In his humanity, he didn't want to do it. He said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. He could have called down a whole world of angels to whisk him away at any moment. He could have done it and he would have been all right because he's God. But friend, he saw your face and he saw my face and the unnumbered millions that would be saved through his blood and he would not be moved from that mission. Let's continue on in verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Through the washing of his blood and the putting on of Christ's spotless robe of a holy life, we are made kings and priests. The Greek word there for priest is hiros. H-I-E-R-E-I-S. Hiros. It means priests or people who offer sacrifices and sacred rites for others. This was kind of powerful as I pondered that, that word and that meaning. As we seek to live as Christ and he puts himself within us, we become priests. And we offer salvation through Christ to other people. We sacrifice our worldly wants so that Jesus can be magnified. As priests unto God, we should behave, be behaving, dressing, and speaking differently. It's a battle. And sometimes it's a battle that I lose. But God is working with me. And that battle can be won through him, through his blood. As priests and as his representatives, our God is with us, as the title says. Jesus walks in us and through us to present his blood to a lost and dying world. We are his proverbial light set on a what? Hill. We're a light set on a hill. But instead of bringing rams and goats as sacrifices, we bring our mortal bodies to him to be used and used up for our family, friends, and strangers. Why? 
because we are our brother's keeper. And if we don't tell them, shame on us. Lord, have mercy on the Christian that is following Christ but doesn't tell others. Being a priest or representative of Christ is a solemn calling, not just reserved for the ordained minister or the church board member. It is solemn and humbling to be the vessel through which other people will see Jesus. But it is also the most important work and the most rewarding work. I have felt the most rewarded when I'm telling others about my faith. Unfortunately, sometimes my words don't match my life. But we're working on it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it with Jesus. Revelation 1 verse 7. Continue on. We've got a lot of material to get through. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. There is a lot of doctrine just within the first chapter of Revelation I started to notice as I started going through this. This is the great culmination of everything. The world is dark out there, brothers and sisters. And it's true that it's only going to get darker and bleaker. But as it gets darker, God's people re resemble him more fully. And the light of heaven will shine into this world for everyone to see and everyone will be brought to a decision. That is Christ-like. This is satanic. Never forget, no matter how crazy this world gets, the night is darkest before the dawn, and the dawn is coming. This section speaks to the heart of the secret rapture deception. It says, Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. As good Seventh-day Adventists, you can pick out the truth of the rapture here. The Bible teaches, and SDAs believe in a rapture. We just don't believe that it's secret. Amen. Satan has left the Christian world deceived on this, and we must be about our Father's business in exposing the truth. Amen. Scripture attests to this truth. I'm going to go through these scriptures. You can write them down or go back and listen to the recording. As I said, I've got a lot to get through. Matthew 24 and verse 30 says this, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 18. For the Lord himself shall descend with a what? Shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. It's going to be loud. It's going to be so loud that the next statement says, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I love this statement. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. These words should be a comfort. That God is coming. There's a reason why the apostle says comfort one another with these words. Satan has deceived the world. Some believe that Christ is coming in a secret manner even though Christ himself said if they tell you that he's in the desert, don't go. If he's in the upper room, don't go there. And there's a lot of people that don't believe he's coming at all. Say, where's the promise of his appearing? Friends, maybe you have a doubt today, and maybe you're feeling skeptical, but as I read the Bible and how it describes the last days and what will take place, I cannot shake the conviction on my heart, and no one can move me from the, from the belief that I hold that I hear the footsteps of an approaching God. Is it getting darker out there? But there are more with us than there are with the forces of darkness. I say, let the darkness come, because my God dwells in light unapproachable. My Christ, 
can, through the Holy Spirit, guide me through it. Just a little while, friends, and he's going to shine forth. The skies will roll back like a scroll, and we will see Jesus coming. He has always been a light in the midst of darkness. Desire of Ages 632 says this. Our dear sister Ellen White says this. Christ is coming with clouds and with great glory. A multitude of shining angels will attend him. He will come to raise the dead and to change the living saints from glory to glory. He will come to honor those who have loved him and kept his commandments and to take them to himself. I love that, to take them to himself. He has not forgotten them nor his promise. He hasn't forgotten you. There will be a relinking of the family chain a little longer and he will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Amen. That's a promise. And I draw hope from it. We need to remind each other that Christ is coming and we need to comfort one another. When bad things happen in our lives, when things are falling apart in our families or at work or whatever the thing is, Christ is coming. Maybe something's happening for a reason to get me ready. Revelation 1, verses 9, 9 through 11, as we continue. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. <clears throat> I just took my eye off the page. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a voice of a great trumpet saying, this is the words of Jesus. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto, and, uh, and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. I am going through a chapter-by-chapter -chapter study, so there will be messages on those seven churches. But what can we glean from these three verses? Verse 9 has a wonderful consolation that, once again, I haven't really thought much on until I read this through. When I build my sermons, I like to take a portion of Scripture like this and not look at any commentaries, or any other previous Bible studies, I like to just read it three to four times and let the Holy Spirit massage my mind. John here is referring to us as what? Brothers. Brothers. We view the writers of the New Testament as giants of faith and often look to them as above us. But John and the other writers constantly refer to us as brothers and companions. Giants of faith do not have to be people from a bygone era. Amen? The right Seventh-day Adventist church can be a congregation of mighty people of faith. It simply takes a surrender of the heart and the will to our God. But how often is that surrender such a difficult proposition? We've got things we're holding on to. I don't want to give up this, that, or the other thing. I might have to give up my group of friends. I've been there and I've done it. It's not easy, but it can be easier with the right help. It's my prayer today that if any of you are wavering in the valley of decision over something the Lord has called you to do or give up, my prayer is that you will give him the reins of your life. Stop making him the co-pilot and make him the one steering the ship. Say with the hymnist, I will go where you want me to go, and I will be what you want me to be. <clears throat> John here is basically reiterate, yeah, <laughs> reiterating an idea set forth by Jesus and Paul. He calls us brothers in what? Brothers in what? Tribulation. Tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Once again, you don't have to go to this ver these uh, couple verses. Paul states in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's no wonder why bad things come on us. If we're following Jesus, 
He says, if you follow me, you're going to experience some stuff. Jesus makes a similar statement in Matthew 24, 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So where'd this idea come from that if I follow Jesus, everything's going to be rainbows, sunshine, and unicorns? An enemy has done it. The real source of the hatred and reviling of ungodly people is uh, revealed when Jesus states in John 15 and verse 18, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. The devil does not like God. Amen. So why would the devil's playground be good for Christians? John and the other disciples make it clear that to suffer persecution for the name of Jesus is a cause of glory. Because they knew that if they were being persecuted, they knew if they were suffering for the cause of Christ, they were walking the path that Jesus walked. And the path that Jesus walked, contrary to popular belief, is not always safe. But it's always the best path. Don't get discouraged when these bad things happen. The finish line is close. Amen. We're almost there. John, in calling us a companion in tribulation, also makes us companions in the kingdom and patience of Jesus. Because patience worketh faith. Bad things happen to refine us and to fit us for heaven. That's why later in Revelation it says, Buy of me gold tried in fire. Friends, I promise that our light affliction will be short-lived. But the glory afterward will be eternal. Let's go to verse 10. Revelation 1 and verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. What's the Lord's day? The Sabbath. The Lord refers to the Sabbath as his day. Nowhere else in Scripture does it refer to another day as the Lord's day. Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor seeking thine own words. Never really thought about that, nor speaking thine own words. Our speech should be a little different on the Sabbath. Our speech should be holy all seven days. But on the Sabbath, there's something different. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Luke 4.16 says this, and this is speaking about Jesus. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Jesus went to church on the Sabbath. In Mark 2, 28, Luke 6, and Matthew 12, 8, Jesus says that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. One more verse. Exodus 31, 16 and 17. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. Remember, we just got done talking about how the, we need the whole Bible. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. But how do we know... What day is the Sabbath? How do we know which day is the seventh day? Remember, the commandment says, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It doesn't say remember a seventh day. If we look at the calendar for the work week, 
What day does it start on? Sunday. And ends on what day? Saturday. Or as Seventh-day Adventists call it, and some other Christian faiths, they call it Sabbath. Look at the languages of the earth. Many words, such as the uh, Spanish and Russian word for, sa for Saturday, is a derivative of Sabbath. Almost like God was trying to tell us to remember something. He's telling us to remember the commandment that he said to remember. But what about other faiths? I've got two statements here. Do the other faiths <clears throat> know what the Sabbath, that Saturday is the seventh day? If Protestants would follow the Bible, they would worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping, in keeping the Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. That comes from Albert Smith, Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Baltimore, in a letter dated February 10th, 1920. That's a Catholic statement. We don't want to beat up on our Catholic brothers and sisters because there's some other statements out there too. I've only given you two. Statement from the Lutheran Church from Augustus Neander, History of the Christian Religion and Church, Volume 1, says this, The festival of Sunday, like all other festivals, was only a human ordinance. Other faiths know it. And they know that it's not just a Jewish holiday. In the time of the earthly sanctuary in the Old Testament, the Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is mentioned in Leviticus 23.6. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. What does unleavened bread not do? Rise. There's an important point in that. The event that coincided with 20, uh, Leviticus 23, 6 is found in Luke 23, 56. Christ rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day and did not rise as bread without leaven does not rise. How do I know that he rested on the Sabbath day? Because it says that they didn't go and embalm his body because the Sabbath drew near. And we refer to the day that he was crucified as what? Good Friday. And we refer to Sunday as what? Easter or Resurrection Sunday. Even in death, our beloved Passover lamb rested on the Sabbath. What is Sabbath a memorial of? Creation. Creation. But what else? We don't really go here much, and I'm not going to read all ten verses, but you can write it down. Hebrews 4 and ver verses 1 through 10 claims it as a memorial of redemption and recreation. Desire of Ages, page 6, 769, says this, At last Jesus was at rest, his work completed, his hands folded in peace, he rested through the sacred hours of the Sabbath day. Now Jesus rested from the work of redemption, and through, and though there was grief among those who loved him on earth, yet there was joy in heaven. Glorious to the eyes of heavenly beings was the promise of the future, a restored creation, a redeemed race, that having conquered sin could never fall. Amen? I will not linger long on this point, longer than I already have, because we are in a Sabbath-keeping church. If you would like more information, I would highly recommend our studies on the Sabbath, or that you visit with a deacon or elder, or there's a Bible, there's a website called sabbathtruth.com. The Sabbath is a blessing. Jesus promised through him we would have rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. God is referred to as the Father of all mercies in Corinthians. And through the Sabbath memorial, the three powers of heaven want to have a special connection with you. Let's move back. Let's move down now into verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, 
and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. There it is again. He refers to himself as what? Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. As I said, Christ is our all in all. He's the golden cord woven throughout Scripture. He is the beginning of it all, and he is the awesome consummation of types and figures all throughout Scripture, especially the book of Revelation. The seven churches listed here represent the church throughout various stages of history, showing that this book, is, this revelation was meant for all humanity because he is everyone's great Passover lamb, all people's righteous redeemer. Verses 12 through 17. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. As I said, I know there's a lot to hit. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the, to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. John hears a voice behind him. And when he turns to see the voice, he sees one like the Son of Man. What does Scripture say? Who does Scripture say is the Son of Man? Jesus. So John sees Jesus in the midst of what? Seven candlesticks. Where are the candlesticks? The sanctuary. They're in the sanctuary. This, sanct this is sanctuary language. It's another reason why Revelation goes uninterpreted or interpreted wrongly. Most of Christendom doesn't believe the sanctuary has any bearing on our lives today. But through Scripture, we know that the earthly sanctuary is just a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Are you with me? So here we see Jesus in the midst of seven candlesticks. That means Jesus is standing in what compartment of the sanctuary? The holy place. He's standing in the holy place. That's where the seven candlesticks were on the earthly sanctuary. Remember, it's just a copy of that one. <clears throat> what does the seven candlesticks and seven stars in the hand of Jesus represent? Don't answer. We will let the Bible answer shortly. We will come back around to that. Then John describes what he looks like. He describes what the one like the Son of Man looks like, right? And it's, it's an amazing amalgamation of words, I guess you would say. He's using his own, his own tongue to try to describe something that's so wonderful, to see Jesus in his heavenly glory. <clears throat> He describes them, and if we go back to Daniel 10, which you don't have to go there, if you go back to Daniel 10, we see this being described in these verses is the same one described in Daniel chapter 10, showing that Jesus is all throughout the Bible. Like I said, many allusions or direct quotations in Revelation from the Old Testament. Another reason Revelation goes misunderstood is you have to have Daniel to understand Revelation. You have to use Scripture with Scripture. And unfortunately, even in the Adventist church today, there are people that want to interpret Scripture with the culture of the day. This is not a cultural book. 
This is a book to bring us into the culture of heaven. I thank God that we in Wright, Michigan want the Bible just the way it is. I say, give me the Bible. Holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise. Law and love combining. Till night shall vanish in eternal day. Like I said, we will come back to these seven candlesticks and seven stars. But what is this sharp two-edged sword coming out of the mouth of Jesus? Well, let's use the Bible. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 explains what this sharp two-edged sword is. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This two-edged sword coming out of the mouth of Jesus is his word. It is the Holy Bible. It is the inspired word of God. When we come to the word with a teachable heart, it will cut away our preconceived ideas. It will fillet away our supposition that without Jesus, I am good enough to come to God. But also the word of God is a sharp two-edged sword in the hand of the child, that is, child of God that is fighting off the wiles of Satan. He can come to the point of temptation the brother or sister can come to that temptation and wield the word from memory and slash and cut away the devil's attacks. And we know that if we resist the devil with the word of God, he will do what? Flee from us. The devil cannot stand the word of God. And he cannot stand before the righteous word of God. Finally, when John looks upon Jesus, he does what? as he falls down as though dead. Friends, when I first looked full into the face of Jesus, I was at Michigan Conference camp meeting. I had listened to Brother Mark Finley preach about the love of Jesus and his righteousness with such power that it caused my heart to leap in my chest to realize that there was a Savior and he wanted to claim me even all after the rotten stuff I had done. I felt happy, loved, but unworthy. But like John here in Revelation 1, I heard Jesus speak to my mind and my heart, fear not. I heard him say through the Holy Spirit in my heart, these Adventist people are your family. If God doesn't want us to fear, and Jesus promises to come into the heart of whoever will heed the knock on the door, how can we turn from such a loving and merciful God? Revelation 1.18, we are coming towards the end here. We've only got 18, 19, and 20. Revelation 1 verse 18 says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. In verse 18, we see evidence of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Amen. We also see the eternal nature of Jesus. Some people believe that Jesus was created. That's not what the scripture says. His goings forth are from everlasting. And this is a deception that is coming into the Adventist church. Elder Jim and I had gone to the scripture in Isaiah where it, says, where it refers to him as the Heavenly Father and the Almighty God. God. Jesus was with God in the beginning from eternity past, past. This verse promises, Jesus promises that the grave doesn't have to be the final destination. He holds the keys to the grave because he defeated Satan and he will one day wake up his faithful saints. Chapter 20, or verse 20. Skip down to verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels 
uh, the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So there's our answer to what they represent. Sometimes if we just keep reading the stuff, it'll explain itself. Verse 20 answers our question from verses 13 and 16. What are the seven candlesticks and what are the seven stars? Seven candlesticks represent the seven churches to which John was writing and the seven stars represent the seven angels under those churches. But why does it matter? Why does that matter to us? Because as I said, the seven churches represent what? The seven churches represent the church, the Christian church throughout the stream of history. And where is Christ seen in verse 13? In the midst of the candlesticks, which represents the churches. Our Christ, our God, walks amongst our churches. Our God is with us. Our faith sees our God as walking with us, not somewhere out there in the ether, detached from us, not caring what's happening to us. <clears throat> it pictures him trying to reach out to us. Our God is reaching out to us to guide us back to him. The Old Testament God told Moses to build him a sanctuary so that he could dwell among his people. Christ is seen among his people in this Symbolism. Great and marvelous is our God. Our God is with us. When we are still, we can hear him. We know we can know about him and we can know him personally. Desire of Ages, page 483. Through all of our trials, we have a never failing helper. Though now he is hidden from mortal sight, the ear of faith can hear his voice saying, Fear not, I am with you. However much a shepherd may love his sheep, he loves his sons and daughters more. Jesus is not only our shepherd, he is our everlasting father. Because we are the gift of his father and the reward of his work, Jesus loves us. Reader, he loves you. Heaven itself can bestow nothing greater, nothing better, therefore trust. It was, a, it was a powerful statement to me because she refers to us as a gift and a reward. I don't know if we appreciate just how much God loves us. She says, because we are the gift of his father and the reward of his work. I know I don't always contemplate enough the love of God, the length, breadth, and depth of his love. My appeal today is that we will take time this week to contemplate the love of God, to view ourselves as the ransomed of God and as the object to which he put such a high value on that he gave himself for us. Also that when we are hedged in by Satan, when times seem most bleak, we will remember that our God is there with us. He is walking amongst our candlestick. I hope today's message has been a blessing to you just as much as it has been a blessing for me to study. Join me in singing our closing hymn, 487, I Come to the Garden.